Now, based on the report that the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Iran and recently traded harsh rhetoric with the Israeli ambassador during the visit to the United Nations, and this is what the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Iran said, and I quote. The Security Council must act now to halt Israel's war and enforce an immediate ceasefire, and by that, to save innocent lives. And of course, certainly, the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations did not sit there quietly and listen to such rhetoric, and responded by saying, and I quote, "Our position regarding Lebanon has always been very clear." We would prefer a diplomatic solution. We are entirely focused on achieving our objectives. End quote. How should we understand the trade of blow at this moment? And given the fact, again, if you follow the news, that recently the Israeli airstrike killed Hezbollah Balat leader, and of course, this is such a shocking news not only to the international community and particularly to the citizens in Israel and also Iran. How do we understand the tension at this moment? And also, what about this military assessment today? Does that mean that military power surely top the agenda? And also, by gaining more military power, does that mean that Iran is able to perform more? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite our distinguished speaker, and who is Professor Jim Shichaksi. Professor Chaksi is a distinguished professor. He was a former chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures, and the former chair of the Department of Central Eurasia Studies. He is currently of the director of the Inner Asia and Euralic National Resource Center at Indiana University, and he focuses specific, uh, specifically on Islam, Iranian, and Persian studies. He has conducted field work in Iran, UAE, Omar, Jordan, Israel, and in many other countries. Well, Professor Choksi, and welcome back to the missing piece. Thank you for having me back. Well, Professor Choksi, again, based on our last conversation, so much has happened. Of course, that the entire world is talking about that Israeli airstrike. Killed the leader of Hezbollah, and also I want to read something to you. I want to get your reaction to this? Based on the report, it says the air the strike was Israel's most aggressive move in two weeks of elaborate intelligence operations. And I think last time you and I we didn't really get a chance to touch on this topic, but I want to get started. Regarding this internal perception and the role of the military and paramilitary from Iran and Israel at this moment, what do you say to them? So here's what I think is we should keep in mind: that the Israeli strike that took out Nasrallah did not take out a head of state.、Mm. Nasrallah essentially was a regional warlord. And so, if we put things into into sort of shall we say global perspective, this is not like、uh, the、uh, the Israeli government attacked the Ayatollah Khomeini, or even the Prime Minister or President of Lebanon, or the King of Jordan. No, we what has happened in the Middle East over the last few decades is the rise of military armed,、uh, shall we say, pseudo state groups. Mm. And Hezbollah is one of these pseudo state groups. It ultimately has a lot of influence in Lebanon, a great deal of influence of the Lebanese government, but it is not really a part, an elected or or, or even appointed part、mm. of the state.、Mm. Uh, it is it is an armed faction that gradually became more and more powerful, came to control southern Lebanon, became essentially an ally, a proxy, and then a vassal of、uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran. And we're seeing the same happen with the Houthis. Now,、mm. the Houthis are, shall we say, a partial state, where they are in Yemen. You have had a civil war, and、uh, the country is fragmented, and the Houthis control one part of it. So, again, Lebanon, also politically unstable, has you know a, a less than,、uh, shall we say, functional government,、mm. and so Hezbollah rose up. And、uh, Hezbollah carried out its own war, essentially with Israel, and and we are now seeing、uh, Israeli attempt to decapitate、mm. 
mm. uh, the almost the entire leadership of Hezbollah at this point, mm. and also them tending to do the same with Hamas uh, in Gaza. Uh, now, whether Israel will venture further, so far we have seen attacks by Israel in Lebanon, in Syria, in Gaza, mm. and on the West Bank. Mm. And we've also seen them retaliate against uh, uh, Houthi missiles mm. uh, in uh, in Yemen. Now, in fairness to the Israelis, the uh, retaliations against the Houthis, for example, have occurred after the Houthis have fired missiles mm. at uh, Tel Aviv, at the airport, etc. The battles with uh, Hezbollah have been long going on. Mm. And you know, if we go back to where all the where the most recent conflict started, they started with that tremendous, deadly civilian attack uh, by Hamas mm. ag you know, against an Israeli music festival. So you can sort of see the you know the the and and of course it's escalated. The the problem I think that's going to face Israel is what do they do next? Uh, the the problem with decapitating these kind of uh, organizations, as we've seen with the Islamic State, with Al-Qaeda, mm. uh, is that new leaders come up. So how do you solve the issue on the ground? That's become the greatest problem. And the United States experienced that in Iraq, in mm. Afghanistan. Mm. So, you know, how, so that is the unknown part of all this. Mm. Will, uh, will, will it escalate further with Iran? Unclear. And I think it's unclear only because they don't share borders. Mm. They're each a long way from each other. Mm. So any escalation would have to be wire missiles. Mm. And uh, the question is, at what point uh, do both countries say, well, you know, it's not worth destabilizing their own populations? Mm. That's the that's the great unknown. And if you think about it, Iran has a population of approximately 91 million people. Mm. These are people whom the majority of them are under the age of 45, mm. which means that they grew up after the Islamic revolution. Mm. Okay, so they don't know a to totalitarian state under the last Shah. Mm. They know a totalitarian Islamic Republic. Mm. So the Iranian population also is looking at this very warily. They don't want a war with Israel. Mm. They want uh, to have good relations with China, with Russia, with the United States, with the region, uh, uh, including Israel. Mm. And and so this is the bind, I think, in many ways also between leaders and leaderships in each country. Mm. Professor Choksi, before we bring China, U.S. and Russia into our conversation, yeah. again, you briefly touch on this Iranian's political statement or this political state at this moment. But I think... I and mean, again, from my perspective, and also from our viewers' perspective, let's talk about people's aspirations. I mean, again, you mentioned that today, when we look at the Iranians, surely no one would like to build additional enemies or unnecessary enemies with the rest of the world. I mean, again, I have to say that fewer wars that we are experiencing and the better for the uh, greater future or even better for the uh, yeah. mankind but going back to the question what are actually people looking for when we look at this country of iran so in other words how should we interpret that people's aspirations we understand that across the region across uh, uh, the spectrum wars and conflicts are surely unavoidable because we're looking at political economic and social differences but down to the internally speaking mm -hmm. how do we define or how should we understand this after aspiration of the iranian citizens what do they say when they look at the news, the head of the uh, Hezbollah was killed, and also the tension, and also the war with Israel, and of course, this chaos within the Middle East. And what do you say to that? So, the impression that we get from the Iranian people, and this includes uh, uh, poll data, survey data, and all, indicates that the majority of the Iranian people, of course, are very pro 
nationalistic for their country. Mm. That does not mean, however, that they want to engage in a incessant warfare and conflicts in the region, because as you pointed out, that's counterproductive to their own lives. Mm. You're looking at a population which uh, does have aspirations of global interaction, of being able to be educated around the globe, uh, to be able to uh, trade with every other every country freely, uh, to have people visit them, be able to visit people, to not have the stigma of being a rogue nation. And so you, you on the one hand, and I would say across the Middle East and in many other parts of the world as well, you have regimes that pursue their own agendas. Mm. And then you have what the people hope uh, can be accomplished. And so within Iran, you have a population which, shall we say, is increasingly distrustful of their regime. We've mm. seen periodic uprisings and rebellions being quite violent. Uh, and, uh, and, and the roots of those are social, domestic, social, and economic problems. Uh, inflation, housing prices, That the latest estimate I saw was that uh, the uh, ability to pay off a two-bedroom apartment in Tehran for the average Iranian would take them 177 years mm. to pay off, off the loan or mortgage on, an, on a two-bedroom apartment. So this should give you, and this is you know increasingly across Iran, um, every city the population is urbanizing there's not there's unemployment but there's also unemployment mm. and the it's a highly educated population most of them under the age of 50. Mm. many and as you graduate from university there's aspiration to get a good job mm. there are no jobs mm. they are making do with small you know uh, underemployed tasks here and there so all that is uh, is percolating. The, there's great deal of corruption in the system, economic corruption. So all these factors are coming together. And then, of course, there is the regime trying to control it, not just control the, uh, the dissatisfaction of the people, but also then trying to impose a fundamentalist religious view mm. on the population. And so all that is, shall we say, uh, what is causing domestic concern domestic strife. And uh, so from the Iranian uh, population's point of view, for them, the death of Nas Nasrallah is not a big loss mm. because they see the money that Iran is spending supporting uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, etc., et as money better spent at home. And of course, we're seeing these sentiments around the world where countries and pure populations are looking and saying, well, yeah, countries have foreign policies, quite often, uh, shall we say, aggressive foreign policies, but the reaction, at least within the population, is let's spend that money at home mm -hmm. to better the population. So that's, shall we say, the biggest tension within Iran. And of course, there is fear that a broader war with Israel could mean strikes against Iranian cities. Uh, and, uh, and, and they don't want to deal with that uncertainty either. Mm. Professor Choksi, again, let's talk about the um, the war, I mean, between Israel and Hamas at this moment. And of course, we know that on October 7th, that Hamas led this devastation and upon the nation of Israel. But again, based on the uh, report that Hezbollah began firing across the Lebanon-Israel border shortly after the Hamas-led October 7th attack on southern Israel, and also that caused more than a thousand people and also sparked the war in Gaza. Now, at this moment, how should we understand the presence of Hezbollah at this moment? I mean, again, you mentioned that the airstrike did not really take out the head of the entire organization, but still, when we look at the complication of Iran, look at the complication of Israel, what does the presence of Hezbollah mean at this moment? And also, why do you think that the international community continue to point fingers to Iran when we look at the presence of Hezbollah? And also, one particular thing that I noticed that during the recent visit to United Nations, 
Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu before he was about to make the dress. More international diplomats actually got up and left the building right before he started to speak. So putting everything together, again, what do we know or what do we say about Hezbollah? And why do you think the international community pointing fingers to Iran and also leaving the uh, uh, the address even before Benjamin Netanyahu start to speak? I think I think if you were to start with the reactions at the United Nations, I think the world community is sending a message to Iran, to Israel, to these quasi states, mm. Hezbollah, Hamas, etc., to that the time is coming to cut it out, mm. to settle the differences, to try to reach accommodations, and to not throw the entire region into chaos. And because of the strategic importance of oil and gas, not throw, throw the world economy into a global recession. Mm. And I think, so that's the message. In other words, it, the, the message being sent is, yes, Hamas, Hezbollah started it. Israel is now decapitating the leaderships of these groups. But the fear, of course, is that these groups may rebuild and that these conflicts will continue and continue and gradually destabilize Israel itself, destabilize Jordan, has the impact of probably destabilizing Saudi Arabia, mm. the Emirates, and ultimately destabilizing Iran. And the point of fingers at Iran is because Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, even the, re the regime in Syria, the Assad regime, all depend on Iran mm. for finances, for weapons. So the Houthi missiles, the Hezbollah rockets, all the rest are not just, uh, some are directly supplied by Iran, some are uh, manufactured locally based on Iranian technology. And I think the important difference also is that unlike Russia mm. that can afford to purchase Iranian weapons for the war in Ukraine, mm. Hezbollah, Hamas, etc., do not have the money mm. to buy these weapons. They, these, this is part of Iran's attempt to exert its military influence in the region. And what the world is also saying is, look, this, this is counterproductive. There are other ways to exert influence, mm. more positive, constructive ways to, uh, to show influence rather than warfare. Mm. Professor Choksi, let's bring U.S. into our conversation. Right after the uh, news broke out, sitting U.S. President Joe Biden said in a claim, and I quote, his death, and regarding to the Hezbollah leader, that it's a measure of justice for his many victims, and including thousands of Americans, Israeli and Lebanese surveillance. Now, at this moment, how should we understand this reaction from the U.S.? I mean, again, before taping the show that you and I, we talk about so much uncertainty right now. We don't know who will be the next president for the U.S. after election. And also, we still don't know how the next president of U.S. is going to delegate the relationship between U.S. and Israel and U.S. and Iran. But meanwhile, people are still very concerned regarding the word sanction upon Iran and also the sanction upon other critical countries in the Middle East. So based on Joe Biden's current statement, what do we or how do we assess the attitude? And also, do we believe that Iran is also paying attention to Harris, to Trump and also to any other officials and just waiting for the opportunity or waiting for this um, uh, engagement so maybe the dialogue can be restored or maybe the relationship can be restored. What do you say to that? And, and the interesting thing is that uh, President Biden's uh, uh, reaction was echoed throughout Lebanon mm. where, uh, where a lot, because these sort of paramilitary groups, these pseudo states, do oppress their own populations as well. Mm. They deal in narcotics. They deal. They deal in human trafficking. They deal in weapons. Uh, they are. Uh, they are 
soldiers are not controlled by the state so that they you know there's extortion so the the death of nasrallah uh, and the and the death of as many of his deputies have indeed been celebrated even in lebanon even in syria in other parts of the middle east as well and uh, so the, the 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 removal of these sort of shall we say unelected or, and frankly warlords uh, it, it's sort of like the uh, w- when uh, Osama bin Laden was killed, mm. the world did not mourn. The world did not mourn for, the, for his demise, and so I think so. That's part of that reaction. Now, what happens in the long run uh, once the United States election is done? Is it possible to wo- find a way forward with Iran? On the one hand, Iran keeps offering the possibility of renewing negotiations. Mm. Uh, the, on the other hand, however, the uh, Iran is also involved in all these activities. Mm. So I think what what it doesn't matter whether it is Trump or Harris. Uh, I think what is going to ha- the sort of the real outcome is going to be one of whoever the president is. Is there a way for Iran to become? A, a constructive player in the region and the world. And I think that would ultimately be welcomed by China as well, mm. because Iran sits there in a sense, if you wish to, between China and the Middle East. Mm. And uh, any sort of destabilization in the Middle East does ultimately have a direct impact on the Chinese economy. Mm. And any and any tensions between the United States, irrespective of President and the Middle East, particularly Iran, also has an impact. Mm. So uh, I think that the sort of the longer range picture here is going to be how does Iran uh, adapt to the changing situation in the Middle East, where many of its proxies have now been decimated by Israel. Mm. Uh, Is it going to try to rebuild these proxies and continue the battle? Or is it going to say, okay, this is an opportunity to rethink a path and because in many ways, it's also beneficial to lose one's proxies. Mm. You, you know, you end up in a, stuck in a situation where the Iranian government is pumping millions of dollars a day towards these groups. Mm. Money that it could use to stabilize its own country. Mm. And, and let's face it, uh, people are always happier when they feel that their country is looking after them, mm. not when their country is looking after someone else. Mm. So even in terms of re- re- Iranian regime security, the money would be better spent at home. Mm. Uh, and then, and once the domestic is stronger, then one becomes stronger on the international stage. Mm. I mean, you know, as when the United States has been strong at home, they're strong on the international stage. When China is strong at home, it's strong on the international stage. Mm. When Russia is strong at home, it's strong on the international stage. So the question that remains here to be seen is, well, you know, this immediate conflict in the Middle East will eventually abate. Mm. But the underlying tensions are not going to change. Mm. The question is, can, can there be a way forward? Can Iran play a way forward, which not just makes the world community feel safer, but makes its own people mm. feel secure? Mm. That, I think that's going to come down to a great one, one of the great calculations for the Iranian leadership. Mm. Professor Choksi, I want to press forward with the concept of nuclear weapons. I mean, again, since the war in Ukraine, that the entire international community is very concerned about such threat. I mean, again, Vladimir Putin has lashed out the rhetoric, its possibility to use nuclear weapons to win the war over Ukraine, uh, with Ukraine. And also we've seen that countries such as North Korea, you know, previously used harsh rhetoric to threaten the U.S. with rhetoric as well. But right now, again, people are also very concerned about this nuclear weapon development in the nation of Iran. You mentioned that uh, uh, the the people uh, uh, in Iran, they do not like the war and do not like uh, making enemies with other countries. And also, they surely never experienced this Iranian revolution in the past. But 2024, how do we know that the leadership in Iran are really actually 
patient, or even even may not be the word patient, but can be s- stabilized so that the concept of nuclear weapons won't be brought to the table. And also, as this U.S. election is about to finish. How do we know that this discussion will be never brought on the table? Because we know that if we get North Korea, get Russia, get Iran, they all start to using or even trying to tempting to get this idea of nuclear weapons. This is not going to end well for the no. entire world. No, not, so, but for anyone, right? For anyone. So, Professor, yeah. what what do you yeah. say to that about this whole uh, uh, nuclear weapon uh, uh, concept? And and, and and will that's the madness, isn't it? Uh, it, is. it is truly mutually assured destruction. It doesn't matter what one's population is. It doesn't matter you know, the because yes, if Iran raises up its nuclear missiles, and it, and right now it still hasn't tested, but it, everyone acknowledges. I mean, the United States Secretary of State said Iran's probably one or two days away from being able to have a nuclear weapon if it decided to have one. Mm. So let's let's say the North Koreans, the Russians. The Iranians raised uh, uh, nuclear weapons. We're going to see the Israelis raise their weapons. We're going to see the Americans raise their weapons. We're going to see the Chinese raise their weapons. And no one's going to sit around and wait uh, to have their populations decimated. And that, yes, that is the greatest danger that we face, particularly, I mean, let's be quite honest. There are responsible, and there are more, there are more responsible, shall we say, and less responsible actors on the nuclear stage. North uh, North Korea is not a responsible actor, mm. b- based on its words. Uh, Iran, based on its words, is not. And and unfortunately, Russia is increasingly becoming so, and the the stakes to to threat to get in war, make nuclear threats over. Ukraine is is to blow things so completely out of proportion. Mm. Uh, it's not like Russia itself is being threatened by China or the United States or Britain or anything. They have, this fight is over a third country on the borders of Russia. So uh, uh, just like you know Iran's constant threatening that you know it could do this or it could do that. Uh, the interesting thing in all this, of course, is that Israel does have nuclear weapons, mm. but you don't hear the Israelis talk about, you know, blowing up the world. That's right. Uh, and and that's that that you know that that shows caution there. The United States has nuclear weapons; they don't talk about blowing up the world. The mm. Chinese have nuclear weapons; they don't talk about blowing up the world. So it may come down after the U.S. elections for the, for. The People's Republic of China and the United States of America to, to maybe sit down with some of the other countries and say the time has come whether you have nuclear weapons or whether you are capable of having them. Mm. And there are many countries: South Korea, Japan, Germany, Canada. Many countries that are capable of of assembling a nuclear weapon. Mm. Uh, it's, many of them don't. Uh, South, uh, South Africa had and gave it up. Mm. Uh, so. There caveats, as you pointed out, there is a point where this kind of rhetoric is very dangerous mm. and it is being thrown around for relatively minor issues. Mm. It is not like the internal existence of the nation of Iran is threatened. Mm. It is not like the internal existence of uh, you know the you know of Russia is threatened. And uh, and and so that's a great concern. And Putin's increasing uh, rhetoric is is extremely concerning because yeah, there, there there will be very little left of our entire global population, and 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 so that that that's that's a serious concern. Mm. And, uh, and now that is not going to happen over you know the Israeli battles with Hezbollah or Hamas or anything like that. Uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, w- w- but what what can happen is you know the the rhetoric can lead to uncertainty mm. and it's always good to sort of you know tamper that down and I think what you saw at the United Nations is sort of a general s- s- sort of reaction saying look yes we understand there are regional conflicts we do understand that sometimes nations have to take actions 
against each other across borders, but let's keep it within reason. Mm. Professor Choksi, I want to ask you the last question by inviting China into our dialogue. I mean, again, before taping the show, that you and I, we talk a bit regarding the role of China. I mean, for years that since the war in Ukraine broke out, that many sides have been pushing China to take a stand, to condemn Russia, and also hopefully can join the uh, uh, international community to uh, stand behind Ukraine. But right now, today, when we look at the war in Israel and also look at Hamas, look at Hezbollah, finally, China has to make a decision. So China cannot afford to be a bench player at this moment. But meanwhile, again, we're looking at this economic interest from China to Iran or vice versa. And also we're looking at this political relationship between China and Israel. So Professor Choksi, from your perspective, I want to hear your final thoughts. How do you think that China can balance um, or even juggle among all those partners or uh, friends or you know, economic interests at this moment. What do we know that how or how do we know that even China is going to make the wise decision at this moment? Your final thoughts. Oh well, I want to say to to the if I may address the leadership of China. Welcome to the world stage. <laughs> These are the uncertainties. This is the complexity of being a superpower mm. and, and realizing that there are no easy decisions, there are no clear decisions. Mm. Uh, it is, and, and that's why partnerships are important, mm. but partnerships that are stable. So, yes, China has influence with Iran. And so maybe sometimes it is necessary for China to have, despite the economic dependence on Iranian oil and gas, mm. a very hard conversation with Iran and say, look, behave, because after all, China can always switch its en energy needs to Saudi Arabia. Mm. Okay, so there's, you know, there's that now. China also has economic interests with Israel. Mm. Again, there are possibilities to have hard conversations. There are possibilities to, despite the tensions between the United States and China, and all this sort of talk about the two nations maybe going to war and all this sort of stuff, then, then, you know, there's the need to sort of to temper down those kind of conversations mm. uh, to uh, that kind of a talk to realize that the that it can really be a win-win for both nations, mm. uh, and and that China should be involved, uh, but it needs to be yes gained with Russia. Irrespective of where China stands with Russia, one thing that China should say is, Putin, we don't at all want you talking about the use of nuclear weapons mm. because that's madness. We're just talking about Ukraine. We're not talking about, you know, something happening to the entire world, but that's what you're bringing up. Mm. That's the point of, you know, being able to look at other world leaders and say, no, this is not appropriate conversation. Mm. And uh, yes, you have a war, a border war with Ukraine over some disputed territory. But let's keep it within that perspective. And let's understand that, yes, it's also a conflict between Russia and Europe and Russia and the United States. But the United States is not directly attacking Russia. Russia is not attacking the United States, Europe and all. No, these are proxy wars. Keep them within that. So. Yes. So this is this is shall we say the the uh, China is growing up mm. uh, and onto onto to, it used to be an important em uh, empires. It's returning ma in ma major ways to the world stage, and in returning to the world stage, mm. the, the, the 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 judgment of the future will be how China acts, and the more the more it is a responsible player, mm. the more history will see modern China in a favorable light. That's right, Professor Choksi. Again, I mean, we don't know what will happen to the US election. I mean, again, we're exactly. we're still less than 50 days away. And also, right. we don't know how the war uh, in Ukraine and also the war in Israel will continue to carry out. But again, I agree with you 100%. Country such as China, Japan, Germany, South Korea, etc. are 
I mean, again, could no longer afford just to be silent towards the international crisis or international community. It is time really to step up to make the wise decision. Well, again, ladies and gentlemen, it's such an honor to speak to Professor Choksi. Again, Professor Choksi is currently the director of the Inner Asia and Uralic National Resources Center at the Indiana University Blooming Bloomington. Again, and his research covers widely on Iran, on Persian studies. I strongly encourage everyone go online to connect with Professor Choksi. Again, it's been a pleasure, Professor, and thank you so much again for your time to be on the show. Let's keep in touch, and we'd love to have you back on the show. Hopefully, next time we talk will be the after-election results come out. So thank exactly. you so much for doing that.